Hello and welcome to Root of Remose, a poetry writing series in which we observe the mechanics, aesthetics, and meaning of the greatest founding texts of the Western poetic tradition. Today we're doing a deep textual analysis of Tablet 1 of the Epic of Gilgamesh. As I mentioned last time, I'm going to be reading the standard Babylonian version, He Who Saw the Deep, translated by Andrew George in 2000, and it's actually right here. So. That's the one I'm using. It's the first translation in that collection. While we will be touching on the formal and narrative structure of the poem, the main emphasis is going to be on the symbols and themes that are represented in the Epic of Gilgamesh. As modern readers, I think that this approach will be the most fruitful in the process of making sense of the text and finding value in its poetic verse. For the writers watching, this video should help direct your attention to how this poem both creates emotion as well as constructs allegory. I think that these are two aspects of writing that are well executed in the Epic of Gilgamesh that we should be able to learn from. If you're curious why I'm choosing to not go over the presence of sound in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the reason is pretty straightforward. Basically, the cuneiform deciphering process is very complex, and I'm not an Assyriologist or a translator. So really, I think it would be strange for me to make meaning claims about the relationship of sound between the lines of verse when I'm reading an English translation, a language so far removed from the origin language and origin sounds. With all of that out of the way, as always, there are timestamps available for each topic I cover in this video, so please use that to your advantage. Additionally, feel free to leave any questions or comments that you have pertaining to the topic of this video. And with that, we'll get started on the poetic analysis of Tablet 1 of the Epic of Gilgamesh. All right, so I'm going to read the first few stanzas of the Epic of Gilgamesh Tablet 1 and then I will go over some of my points for the introduction. He who saw the deep, the country's foundation, who knew was wise in all matters. Gilgamesh, who saw the deep, the country's foundation, who knew was wise in all matters. He everywhere, and learnt of everything the sum of wisdom. He saw what was secret, Discovered what was hidden, he brought back a tale of before the deluge. He came a far road, was weary, found peace, and set all his labors on the tablet of stone. He built the rampart of Uruk, the sheepfold, of holy Iana, the sacred storehouse. See its wall like a strand of wool, view its parapet that none could copy. Take the stairway of a bygone era. Draw near to Iana, seat of Ishtar the goddess, that no later king could ever copy. Climb Uruk's wall and walk back and forth, survey its foundation, examine the brickwork. Were its bricks not fired in an oven? Did the seven sages not lay its foundation? A square mile is city, a square mile date grove, a square mile is clay pit, half a square mile the temple of Ishtar, three square miles and a half is Uruk's expanse. See the tablet box of cedar, release its clasp of bronze, lift the lid of its secret, pick up the tablet of lapis lazuli and read out the travails of Gilgamesh, all that he went through. Suppressing all other kings, heroic in stature, brave scion of Uruk, the wild bull on the rampage, Going at the fore, he was the vanguard. Going at the rear, one his comrades could trust. A mighty bank protecting his warriors, a violent flood wave smashing a stone wall. Wild bull of Lugobanda, Gilgamesh, the perfect in strength, suckling of the august wild cow, the goddess Ninsun. Gilgamesh the tall, magnificent, and terrible, who opened passes in the mountains, who dug wells on the slopes of the uplands and crossed the ocean, the wide sea to the sunrise, who scoured the world ever searching for life and reached through sheer force 
Utanapishti, the distant, who restored the cult centers destroyed by the deluge and set in place for the people the rights of the cosmos. Who is there can rival his kingly standing and say, like Gilgamesh, it is I am the king. Gilgamesh was his name from the day he was born, two-thirds of him god and one-third human. All right, so first we're going to discuss a bit about the formal structure of the Epic of Gilgamesh. So just looking at what's already been shared, we can see that the formal structure of the poem is fairly consistent. It's made up of stanzas containing two couplets, and each couplet generally contains a complete idea. And within each stanza, they will sometimes repeat an idea, um, and this repeat is called a refrain, but at times they'll do minor changes to kind of reiterate the subject, but then to give more information about the, the subject. So, for instance, when they're talking about just the opening lines, when they're saying, he who saw the deep, the country's foundation, and then line three, Gilgamesh, who saw the deep, the country's foundation. When they're doing a refrain like this, it really provides a sense of them trying to capture the listener's attention and to be very emphatic and explain the significance of that. And it happens all throughout the Epic of Gilgamesh where they'll use refrains to really drive a point, also to be used to really get to the emotional impact of a line. So you'll find that when the form starts to use a lot of refrains near one another, that it's done in order to promote more tension or promote a sort of sense of emotional climax. We'll see that in Tablet 2. There's a part where a fight occurs and they use more repetition. But that's generally what's occurring on a formal level. So they do use the refrain, also anaphora, which is a repeat of a word. And anaphora is used very frequently as a way to continue ideas and to connect ideas. I think even in the beginning, they're using anaphora when they say he, he, he. So they're really focusing on Gilgamesh in that beginning. Aside from the formal structure that's being established in the beginning few stanzas, we also get a very tactile experience beginning in stanza four and then carrying over into the following stanzas. So here we have calls to the listener to observe their environment, to consider the legacy that Gilgamesh has provided them through his, through his journey. This establishment of a very tactile detail being represented in the poem is very fully established in stanza six and seven. So in stanza six, you have a description of the city of Uruk, that there's a date grove, there's a clay pit, there's also the temple of worship for Ishtar, and that all of that is the expanse of Uruk. And what's really interesting is that the following stanza is referring back to the previous stanza in a very interesting way. So when we look, we can see it's mentioning a tablet box of cedar, a clasp of bronze, a lid, and its secret. And all of that, to me, is actually referring back to the previous stanza. There's a connection with this stanza to the previous stanza, the cedar connecting to the date grove and also the clay pit with the bronze and the temple of Ishtar could be seen as connecting to the lid and its secret holding a tablet of lapis lazuli and how even the travails of Gilgamesh also translate to Uruk's expanse. To me, there's a very clear connection that they're trying to make with showing the origin of this story and how it connects to a physical space, to a physical reality. And I just thought that was a very interesting detail that they have. Aside from that, stanza seven is really interesting because it's almost 
like it's breaking the fourth wall in that it's asking the listener or the reader to see the tablet box of cedar release its clasp with bronze lift the lid so it's it's telling you to experience it that's a very avant-garde thing for it to do but it's not it's it's from the very beginning so this establishes a quality of the kind of details the kind of uh, sensory details that'll be all throughout the epic of gilgamesh and it's getting us ready to anticipate that it's putting us in a very tactile kind of frame of mind or a kind of imaginative frame of mind because it's forcing us to already look at our surroundings in order to really think back to Gilgamesh and it's preparing us to then use our full imagination when it's describing the occurrences for this epic. So we've talked about the formal structure that's been established and we're talking about how the literary quality of sensory details has already been established in the poem as well and how that'll be incorporated throughout the poem. And now we're going to look at the next topic, which is the introduction of Gilgamesh in our story. All right, so next we're going to be looking at how Gilgamesh is characterized in the poem. And to do that, we're going to look at some of his names his abilities and personality, his accomplishments, and then how these details organically transition into the actual conflict of the narrative. The name Gilgamesh, the Sumerian signs that are in his name have an inherent meaning and it's believed possibly, possibly, it's not 100%, but it could mean the ancestor is a hero. So that's from the Sumerian sign Bilga, equaling ancestor, and then Mez, meaning hero or young man. And if that seems very on the nose, uh, considering that this is a story about Gilgamesh, that is very common whenever you're looking at literature, that the name very often has a direct correlation to the characteristic of the character that it's describing. Other than the name Gilgamesh, if you look at line 35, he is referred to as the wild bull of Logolbanda. And Logolbanda was actually considered to be his father, who was a king and the second king of Uruk. And the name Logolbanda translates in Sumerian to Logol, meaning king, and then Banda, meaning either young, fierce, and wild. Looking now to the abilities and personality and nature that is revealed about Gilgamesh. So we're told that Gilgamesh is a king and that he is an heir to a wealthier, prominent family. But this is also contrasted with the description that he is like a wild bull on a rampage. And this is then further elaborated, saying that he does very well in battle wherever he is on the battlefield. In the next stanza, they use descriptions of nature to properly elaborate or illustrate his strength. So saying things like he is a mighty bank protecting his warriors. He is a violent flood wave smashing the stone wall, very much a force of nature. This is kind of interesting that he's called the wild bull because later there will be the bull of heaven. And so I wonder if there's a connection with that, if there's meant to be kind of a contrast that's intended. It would seem that there is in some capacity. And in this Mesopotamian mythology, the bull symbolizes strength and also protection. When we look at Gilgamesh and how he is characterized based on his physical attributes, there's a few things that they let us know. First and foremost, the most striking thing about Gilgamesh is that he is described as very big. He's described as three times as big as a regular average person. And we know this because at line 56, they describe Gilgamesh saying, A triple cubit was his foot half a rod his leg, six cubits was his stride. When we compare these to what the equivalency would be, it ends up being three times that of what a normal human would be. 
Also, it's interesting that Gilgamesh is described as having hair that grows thickly as barley. The reference to barley would be considered a symbolic reference to fertility and abundance that would certainly fall in line when they're talking about how tall he is and that his beauty was consummate and that by earthly standards he was most handsome. So those are the physical aspects that they use to characterize Gilgamesh. So next we're going to look at how Gilgamesh is characterized by his personality and also his divine nature. So the name Ninsun actually translates directly to Lady of the Wild Cow. So it's interesting that Gilgamesh has a mother that's considered a wild cow, and then he's also characterized as a wild bull on a rampage. And the characterization of being a wild bull, bulls in ancient Mesopotamia had a symbolic connection to protection and strength. So that's another layer in which they're trying to characterize Gilgamesh. In a way, the relationship between Gilgamesh and his mother demonstrates that Gilgamesh should be seen as being a divine protector of his people. And that directly relates to the next point that Gilgamesh is actually seen and described as two parts divine and one part human. And that's less meant to be taken literal and more figurative, as in to allow the audience to understand that Gilgamesh is more divine than he is human. Now we're going to look at how Gilgamesh was described as far as what he accomplished given who he is. In stanza 10, they begin to elaborate on what tasks he has performed, and the structure is then in interrupted by a semicolon beginning to build a repetition of who. So it just keeps going. Like, there's a long list of things he's done, and they really want to drive home that he's done a lot. Lines 41 to 44, it explains that Gilgamesh accomplished a search for life, reached Utanapishti, restored the cult centers, and set up temples. And then from lines 37 to 44, when they keep using who and an to build upon the idea of how he conquers the natural terrain of the land in search of eternal life, and all of his earthly conquering leads to him rebuilding the cult centers and, as they say, set in place for the people the rights of the cosmos. So it's really taking the very physical things that he's done and demonstrating how they've been able to reach a transcendent or spiritual purpose. Knowing that he is a god, but also a human, and knowing that he's in such a position of power and he has such strength, it really, all of this characterization does a great job of illustrating to the listener the complexity of Gilgamesh, and it creates a sense of emotional investment all of this information is very important so that when we finally get to the point where they are describing the conflict of the story, the inciting incident of the narrative, it helps us to want to understand why, which is one of the strongest ways to build a narrative and to invest the listener. So all of that information is used to then help get us invested into the character of Gilgamesh and to then want to ask why the conflict happens. The next topic, we're going to be discussing how the conflict and the beginning action of the poem's narrative plot begins. So, line 63. In Uruk the sheepfold, he walks back and forth like a wild bull lording over it. Head held aloft, he has no equal when his weapons are brandished. His companions are kept on their feet by his contests. The young men of Uruk he carries without warrant. Gilgamesh lets no son go free to his father. By day and by night his tyranny grows harsher. Gilgamesh, the guide of the teeming people. It is he who is shepherd of Uruk the sheepfold. But Gilgamesh lets no daughter go free to her mother. The women voiced their troubles to the goddesses. They brought their complaint before them. Though powerful, preeminent, expert, and mighty, Gilgamesh lets no girl go free to her bridegroom. 
the warrior's daughter, the young man's bride, to their complaint, the goddesses paid heed. Okay, so here we have an explanation of what goes wrong. So Gilgamesh, he is he is going back and forth in Uruk like a wild bull he's lording over it. So this earlier reference to him being a wild bull on a rampage, that's great on the battlefield, but if you're doing that to your own comrades, that becomes a problem. So he is acting out. He is he has his head held high. He's very very prideful. He's attacking his own comrades without warning. And if that's not bad enough, he's actually taking the women and he's using the women. He even is taking women on their wedding night, coupling with them before the husband. All of this combined, it leads the the people of Uruk are very upset. And so they ask the goddesses to help them. So when we're looking at this section, it does a great job of showing that in spite of how much Gilgamesh has in strength and position and knowledge, that he's senselessly overstepping boundaries of what does not belong to him and going so far as to take the bride's union with their husband, something that so clearly doesn't belong to him. And we know that the people of Uruk know that this is wrong because in Tablet 2, Line 150 to 151, um, there is a reference to a wedding contract and a ceremonial table. And line 161, it mentions that what Gilgamesh is partaking in, they're saying that it's by divine consent, it is so ordained. And so when the character that's in charge of the ceremonial table says that, I really think that this is how the citizens are trying to rationalize Gilgamesh's behavior. And so when we return to Tablet 1, line 78 to 93, we see that the women of Uruk are voicing their complaints to the goddesses. And this demonstrates the citizens were appealing to a higher power in the hopes of stopping Gilgamesh. And it also represents the idea of societal order and forms of existential hierarchy with the expectations of duty and service that's required for certain positions in society. So now we're going to look at more deeply the divine implication of that conflict. So when we're looking at the problems that the gods are referencing, they're talking about Gilgamesh in a few different ways. They state that Gilgamesh has no equal, his tyranny continues to get worse day by day, also, that in spite of his divine role to protect his people, he is abusing his role and his people. And this is something that they, as gods, recognize. The goddesses respond to the complaints of the women by relaying those complaints and problems to the god Anu. So again, there's this existence of a kind of chain of command and a hierarchy that's represented even amongst the gods. So then we will look at what is the solution. And the solution suggested by the gods is the creation of Enkidu. First off, the name Enkidu means Lord of the Good Place. This, of course, is referring to the fact that he is the Lord of the Wild. So starting at the beginning of Enkidu's creation, we know that the goddess Aruru created Enkidu. If we look at the details of how they describe the creation of Enkidu, the goddess Aruru washes her hands and takes a pinch of clay and throws it in the wild. I find these details very interesting and it contrasts in a very interesting way when we compare that to the creation of Adam in Genesis 2-7 and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So that comparison is well known and well referenced. So looking at how Adam is created by God versus how Enkidu is created by Aruru, you can see difference in the tone of how they're created. With Enkidu, there is the cleansing of Aruru, almost a washing of any any prior tasks, 
and then also a very violent throwing into the wild. When you compare the creation of Adam in Genesis, his creation is far more gentle, and he's taken, formed from the dust of the ground, and then life is breathed in through his nostrils. So the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. It's even signifying the nature of man being of dust and of soul, soul of which he got from the breath of life from God. So there's a very intimate connection there that is missing from the creation story of Enkidu. The creation story of Enkidu has a more distant and separated creation. And we know that there is this level, a deep level of isolation and separation for Enkidu when we carry on and read that Enkidu is described as an offspring of silence. And it's not immediately apparent what that means. And it's when you get into the later stanzas that it elaborates. So we also see that Enkidu is knit strong by Ninurta. Ninurta is associated with farming, healing, hunting, law, scribes, and war, and who was the first to be worshipped in early Sumer. So when it says that Enkidu is knit strong by Ninurta, what they're suggesting is that the char- those characteristics imposed upon or given to some part of Enkidu. So lines 105 to 108, they are describing Inkadu, that his body is covered in hair, he has long hair like a woman, and his hair is thick like barley. And this is similar to the way that Gilgamesh was described. In a lot of ways, when you're looking at the descriptions between Inkadu and Gilgamesh, they are very similar. It's almost as if they are mirror images of each other. An explanation for why Gilgamesh and Enkidu mirror each other so much is explained in the stanza when it states around line 100, Let him be a match for the storm of his heart. Let him vie with each other so Uruk may be rusted. Already we see that the reason for Enkidu's creation is to make a match for the storm of Gilgamesh's heart you almost have to wonder how bad this is going to be because it seems a little counterintuitive to use a character's flaw, the main flaw being the storm of Gilgamesh's heart, and then say, hey, let's make that again. For whatever reason, they thought, yes, this is the solution to our problem. So getting back to Enkidu. So Enkidu is said to be the offspring of silence. And I believe the meaning of that is elaborated in the following stanza, when it says on line 108, he knows not a people, nor even a country. So again, it's calling back to that separation that Enkidu has from a family, from a people. So I think that these, all of these details about Enkidu's creation, that he is of the wild and that he doesn't have any real connection to anyone, that's an important detail to keep in mind regarding Enkidu, his origin. The way he was created impacts his character throughout the narrative. So now that we've gone over the creation of Enkidu, we can then look at our next topic, which is when the hunter starts to have problems with Enkidu. Let's look at that part. It starts at line 113 to 121, when the hunter observes Enkidu and then is rejected by Enkidu. A hunter, a trapper man, did come upon him by the waterhole. One day, a second, and then a third. He came upon him by the waterhole. When the hunter saw him, his expression froze, but he, with his herds, he went back to his lair. The illustration that the hunter has not one, not two, but three different encounters with Enkidu, and that regardless of a third attempt that Enkidu doesn't interact with the hunter, he just looks past him and he carries on with his herd. Really, from this, we can see that Enkidu very much identifies with the herd and with the wild, and he himself is a wild man. He has not been socialized at all. He doesn't even recognize the hunter as someone 
to talk to or engage with. And so this very strongly characterizes the problem that the hunter has. So it carries on to explain, the hunter was troubled, subdued, and silent. His mood was despondent, his features gloomy. In his heart there was sorrow, his face resembled one that came from afar. And so the hunter is upset. And he then carries on to relay his problem to his father. And this is a feature of the Epic of Gilgamesh that occurs very often where accounts will be retold to various people, generally someone of a higher status, in order to gain some kind of wisdom or some kind of plan to action. He starts to speak with his father and he's describing that when he encountered Enkidu, he was actually very frightened because he could tell that Enkidu was very strong and that his strength is as mighty as a rock from the sky. So the father then gives his son advice and the father says to the son to go to Gilgamesh and tell him of Enkidu and then to also fetch the harlot, Shemhat, and then that the harlot will seduce Enkidu, which will result in the herd rejecting Enkidu. And so their initial plan, because they know they're not strong enough to take on Enkidu on the basis of strength, they devise this plan to overcome him through a weakness of his own will. And so they know that if they attack his will, that will denigrate his role and bring shame to Enkidu. Line 146 to 160, the hunter goes to Gilgamesh and then Gilgamesh tells him to take Shemat the harlot. So there again is a repeat of the story. So it's building this, this repetition with each character. I think that the significance between the problem that the hunter has with Enkidu and then how the hunter goes to his father and the father then explains what he should do and the son listens to his father and goes to Gilgamesh. There's, through all of these interactions, there is display of structure in the society, this notion that there's a proper way to handle problems. It's interesting when you compare what's happened so far. We have characters that are disrupting the balance in the structure of society. So we have originally Gilgamesh, who is faltering from his position as a king, as a protector, and he's being tyrannical. And so the solution is then those around the person faltering maintain their virtue, to maintain their structure and their beliefs, to appeal to hierarchy. And then, in turn, when Enkidu is created, he is doing what he was designed to do. He was designed as a wild man to protect his, his herd. And so we know that one of the reasons he has a conflict with the hunter is because Enkidu is filling the pits that the hunter digs, he's pulling up the snares that the hunter lays, and he is preventing any of the beasts of the field to be taken by the hunter. And so this demonstrates that Enkidu really should not have been created because while he's doing what is natural to him, what seems to be his actual responsibility, he is disturbing then the natural order of the wild. And so it's causing a conflict that then is occurring on the exterior of Uruk, but being then brought into the interior of Uruk and concerning the people from the inner walls of Uruk. So in two ways, we see how the natural order can be disturbed from someone not doing their duty and then someone doing their assumed duty. All right, so the next topic that we're going to discuss is the interaction between Shemat and Enkidu and how it leads to the fall of Enkidu. So everything goes according to plan. The hunter brings Shemat to the wilderness and they wait for several days by the water hole waiting for Enkidu to come with his herd. And so when he finally arrives to the water hole, Shemhat then reveals herself and then entices Enkidu to come to her and they have sex for six days and seven nights. So after this occurrence, we're told that the gazelle saw Enkidu 
They started to run. The beasts of the field shied away from his presence. Enkidu had defiled his body so pure, his legs stood still, though his herd was in motion. Enkidu was weakened, could not run as before, but now he had reason and wide understanding. He came back and sat at the feet of the harlot, watching the harlot, observing her features. Then the harlot's words he listened intently, as Shemat talked to him, to Enkidu. You are so handsome, Enkidu. You are just like a god. Why with the beasts do you wander the wild? Come, I will take you to Uruk the Sheepfold, to the sacred temple, home of Anu and Ishtar, where Gilgamesh is perfect in strength, like a wild bull lording it over the menfolk. So she spoke to him, and her word found favor. He knew by instinct he should seek a friend. So just looking at their interactions, we see that that there is some connection to be made between sexuality and power. This is demonstrated when it states that Enkidu's body had been defiled and, and as a result, there was a spiritual connection to the herd that was lost. And so this establishes a dual sphere of the wild and of Uruk, and this changes the way things are ordered for Enkidu. So then Shemat explains civilization to Enkidu, something that he is completely ignorant of. She talks about Gilgamesh, she talks about the temples. What's interesting is that upon hearing about the temples and Gilgamesh and Uruk and civilization, what is Enkidu's first response? Enkidu's response on line 220 is, I will challenge him, for my strength is mighty. I will vaunt myself in Uruk, saying, I am the mightiest. There I shall change the way things are ordered. One born in the wild is mighty. Strength he possesses. Right away, his first instinct is to fight Gilgamesh, to challenge him, and to change everything about the civilization that he just found out about. So in a way, Enkidu is already demonstrating that he is so much alike to Gilgamesh because he has a similar desire of the heart, the heart that desires to change the way things are ordered to cross boundaries. Shemat comments on this, and she talks a little bit more about Uruk, and she talks about how it's a civilization where they wear clothing, they have festivals, and she talks about Gilgamesh and how he's a dignified man, and that he is very charming, and that he has a strength mightier than Enkidu's. And she also then finally says to Enkidu, O oh, Enkidu, cast aside your sinful thoughts. Gilgamesh, it is whom divine Shamash loves. The gods Anu, Elil, and Ah have broadened his wisdom. So right there, she's appealing to a divine hierarchy. And she's trying to explain to Enkidu that it's not might that fully gives a person power. There's a level of divinity there's something that transcends the material that enables Gilgamesh to have his power, to have his seat. After Shamash brings this up, she also talks about how Gilgamesh had been having prophetic dreams. This would be an extension of Gilgamesh's wisdom that he has dreams of prophecy, and yet he's not able to interpret his own dreams. He has to outsource interpretation. And so when Gilgamesh is telling his mother of his dream, the dream is actually about Enkidu, and his mother is very open in telling him this. The fact that he has two dreams is very interesting. In the first dream, Enkidu is described as a rock, and then in the second dream, Enkidu is described as an axe. I think the two dreams are symbolizing Enkidu's origin from the wild versus Enkidu as a man-made tool. And so it symbolizes before and after Enkidu's civilization, but in both cases, in both both uh, aspects of Enkidu, Gilgamesh is shown to care deeply for Enkidu. One thing, uh, I just have to mention it because it is kind of strange. In both dreams, it says, you lifted it up, set it down at my feet, and I made it your equal. Like a wife, you loved it, caressed and embraced it. A mighty comrade will come to you and be his friend's savior. They say this twice, like a wife, you'll love him, caress and embrace him. 
And that to me, I mean, that's pretty clear that it's a romantic relationship. With it connecting so closely to camaraderie, it seems kind of strange that they put that in there, but it is in there. So what we can know for sure is that Enkidu and Gilgamesh have a very strong tie and very deeply connected and they do love each other. Gilgamesh lets his mother know that he's very excited to have a friend, to finally have someone to confide in in that way as an equal. Right after Shamat tells Enkidu about the Gilgamesh prophetic dreams, then Shamat and Enkidu begin to make love, which is a very strange way to end the tablet. And I think that the reason for this ending might be so that it can symbolically show a future being created, but Another reason why this is an important thing to touch on is because by Enkidu and Shamat coming into union with one another, it's demonstrating that this is the path that Enkidu is willfully choosing. And so, to some extent, Enkidu is choosing to let this happen. It's because he now has understanding and he has knowledge of what is going to come that he's choosing this. And that is the end of Tablet 1. Alright, so those were all of the main topics that I really wanted to cover in Tablet 1 of the Epic of Gilgamesh. If there's anything that I missed when I was going over my poetic analysis, please let me know. And other than that, I will see you next time and we'll just keep, keep working on uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Take care guys, bye! Oh